Uh, as many of you know, uh, Bernie Cahill is the founding partner and the head of music division at Roar. He's going to be up here uh, conducting the interview for our first segment for a very, very special guest indeed. You do not want to miss this one, ladies and gentlemen. But first, here's a little teaser. We're going to start off with a video right now. Rock and roll. It's critical to blur the line between real and fantasy. Fear is America's favorite drug. My name's Melissa Carbone, and I'm in the business of fear. I am the star that fell from the sky. I am the light that blinded the world. Tonight, your body will be food for flies. If a camper cannot take it anymore and you need to back off, you will hear them say, I want my money! Melissa Carbone with 1031 Productions. They also produce the Haunted Hay Rides. It's hugely <laughs> popular. The ultimate event for movie fans. We submerge you into the experience of horror. The $7.4 billion industry. The campers don't leave bloody, muddy, sweaty, and wet. We oh. didn't do our job. and gentlemen, 1031 Productions founder and CEO, Melissa Carbone. And Roar Entertainment founder and president, Bernie Cahill. Before we get started, not many people put on their masks. <laughs> look under your seats. Really, look under your seats. I need you to play with me. If I'm going to talk about immersive experiences, I need to immerse you guys for a second. And put on your masks. All right, we're getting there. Just indulge me for a second. All right, that looks, that looks a little better. That's what was supposed to happen. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. So welcome all that matters. Uh, today we're going to be having a chat with Melissa Carbone. In my mask. Who is, who is the, the thought leader in immersive entertainment. And I think, uh, I think today the, probably the best place to start would be, can you tell us, first of all, what is, what is we're, we're, it's the buzzword of, of live entertainment right now. Tell us what it means to you. 
Yeah, so immersive entertainment is almost spoken of so frequently it's become jargony. Um, interchangeably, it's used often with interactive, engagement, and immersive. Now, those three words are really different to me. They, they aren't mutually exclusive, and um, you know, they, they definitely can work together. But to me, in the live attraction space, immersive means to bodily submerge your audience into your world. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, when we just did the mask exercise, that's, that's what that was for. I don't want to get up and talk to you guys about immersive entertainment without have immersed, immersing you, have immersed you for a second or two. So, um, you know, when people put on a mask, the alter ego comes out. And um, that's, you know, turning the audience into part of our show is always what we want to do. And, and that's what we wanted to do today, immersed. Well, clearly you're... Uh the Haunted Hayride and the other properties that you're developing is working well for you. They're spreading across the U.S. She's looking, in fact, to expand here in Asia next. So FYI, <laughs> How, what, what's working about what you're doing and, and what's unique about your offering? So 1031 Productions, we're a live, um, we're a live event company that creates, produces, and owns attractions in the horror space predominantly. Um, we're unique in that our philosophy um, takes environments that are already creepy, haunting, um, dark in their demeanor, and we put a model in that environment that has never been put in that environment before. For example, our haunted hayride, we took people that live in a city and we put them in the woods at night. Um, that had never been done. The Great Horror Camp Out is a 12-hour overnight camping experience. Again, that had never been done um, in this space. Uh, we had the very first haunted attraction that ever took place on a ship that actually set sail. Um, so we use environments in a way where they haven't been used before in the horror space. But tell us about, so you said 12 hour overnight. What does that, yeah. give us some detail on that. What does that mean? It, so it's, it, we're creating a world, right? So we take campers um, and we, we submerge them in this very gritty, dirty, bloody, um, rusty environment where they're competing to become what we call a hellmaster. So the ultimate goal of Camp Out is to become a hellmaster, which you know, obviously comes with tons of privileges after, but um, they, you know, have to, they do things from looking for, for through clues, clipping off fingers, um, diving into cadaver bodies to break ribs, all of these items, the ribs, the clipped fingers, um, the, the ears, the noses, the flesh, these are all items that we call skag, and it becomes the commerce um, of the event. So for 12 hours, they are diving, jumping, getting dirty and muddy, and uh, by the time the sun comes up, we will have crowned our winner. And do you create everything yourselves in-house? How, you, how do you produce the events? We create everything in-house. Um, it's me and I have a small team of 10 that uh, works around the clock all year long to create these events. Obviously, when we're in our event season, we have a, lot, a much bigger staff. Uh, but we do, we, we create everything from concept in-house to the building, to the special effects, to building the masks, hiring the cast. We do everything in-house is tell us a little bit about uh, when we when we talked earlier you talked about sort of the pillars of immersive and and the, the different elements can you can you give us a little bit more on that sure it's um you know immersive is funny because people often think it's virtual reality only it's strapping a device to your face or um, having you know simulations that can help people achieve this you know, ultimate degree of suspended disbelief. And, and that's, that's the ultimate goal of creating an immersive experience is to create the, the, the highest degree of suspended disbelief, which is um, suspending judgment of the implausibility of, of a narrative or a fictional um, world. So you can do that, you know, in, in gaming and in video much easier because in the live world, you, ha you can't use those aids. So there's, you know, there's spatial um, immersion, which is making somebody actually feel like they're there in the experience. There's narrative immer immersion, which is engaging somebody so much, obviously, into the, the narration of a story um, that they've excluded their world. There's uh, tactical immersion, which is common in gaming because it's a repetitive, you know, you're, you're, so, you're so engaged in punch, 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 run, 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 jump, that this, that, that repetitive motion has you completely tuned out to your outside world. Um, and strategic immersion, which is like chess. Um, so these are, these are ways that you can achieve immersion um, individually. There's also a ton of sensory involved in, um, in, in 
submerging your audience. And uh, for me and my team, everything that we create, we try to put all of those components into our creations because again, in the live space, it's much harder to achieve the belief, you know, the, that, that sincere belief that goes along with people forgetting the world outside of them. So um, the live space is tricky. So we, we throw everything in in the kitchen sink. <laughs> Right. Well, obviously, it's working for you. You've, you've partnered with Mark Cuban. Live Nation is a partner. Talk about how did those? How did that happen? We know about Cuban from Shark Tank, but talk about a little bit about, about Live Nation and sort of the expansion uh, of your business. Yes. When when we partnered with Mark, obviously, it was a giant. Um, it was a giant platform for us. Uh, just being on the show brought a lot of notoriety to the company. Mark is a huge resource, and he introduced us to Michael Rapino who immediately was really engaged with the model because it, it, it's not being done anywhere. 1031 is really pioneering this space. And um, Michael Rapino has the largest ticketing platform in the world with Ticketmaster, um, more venues than any other com company in the world, and um, obviously a humongous voice. And he saw uh, the company, um, we were introduced through Mark, and really thought that Live Nation could bring a, a resource to us that could help us expand and grow. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last two years is, is pedal of the metal on all these attractions. Great. So let's take a step back now. So uh, immersive entertainment, what, what, what's out there? What was sort of happening when you got into the space and what, what sort of inspired you to get into this? this it's such an interesting space because there's, um, it's, I mean, there's IMAX theaters and there's, you know, there's video games and there's live and, but to me, um, from a, from a live attraction standpoint, I think, um, Yumi Bum Bum Train and Punch Drunk, I think Burning Man, um, has been an immersive experience for years that, you know, kind of, uh, just was ahead of its time. I mean, it's a, it's an in-depth, completely submerging, you know, art festival. Um, I think all of these things have laid the groundwork. I, I think IMAX is doing a great job. Um, but I think in, you know, in this space and in a lot of spaces, the, um, the, there's a lot of uh, startups and independent people who are just crazy enough to think that they can change an industry. And um, you know, I, I think Oculus is a great example of that. They, were, they started out as a crowdfunding venture that gen then got humongous support from Facebook, which allowed them you know, a launching pad that was maybe something they couldn't have done as quickly on their own. So I think a lot of the evolution of this space is coming from independent startups, people who are just a little bit too crazy to listen to reason and they jump in the pool. And I, I, you know, I, I proudly feel that way about 1031 Productions. You're definitely a member of that group. So <laughs> The crazy group. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned Oculus. Talk about virtual reality and uh, immersive sort of immersive entertainment and, and can those two work together? Where do you see it going? Yeah, I, I mean, virtual entertainment and immersive definitely work together. I, I just, I think they're very different. You know, I think that you don't have to be virtual reality to be immersive, um, you know, which is, is kind of goes back to the, to the prior point of being in the live space, creating, you know, for an example at the LA Haunted Hayride. We start the experience before they even get out of their cars. You know, you drive up to the hayride, it's dark, it's cold, you're in a desolate parking lot, and a bus covered with blood shows up to pick you up. You get in that bus, and as you approach the hayride, all you see is this giant orange glow coming out of the trees, you smell hay and apple cider and the, the feel of fog, and that's before you even get on the ride, you know? And then you get on the ride, so right there all of the sensories are already working. Um, you get on the ride and we bring you through this narrative of ghosts of war, um, you know, the, the ghosts of orphans that have burnt down in a, in a burnt down orphanage that are handing you crayon drawings, a demon Santa that busts through an advent calendar and annihilates you with snow. It's, um, you know, the feeling of snow, the smell of the gunpowder, the spatial, you know, immersion of feeling like you're having hand-to-hand -hand contact with a, an orphan. Um, all of these things put the fear, the anxiety into the hay rider. So they're not thinking about what happened at work today or what they're gonna go home to. They're thinking about what's around this next turn. What am I about to encounter? Anxiety, that's what we wanna do. So you've created that suspension of disbelief, which is so important oh. for the experience. Yes, yes, that's the ultimate goal. Got it. Is, talk, talk a little bit about 
I mean, everyone here is in, in the entertainment business in some capacity. Live matters is what we're here to, to discuss. What, what sort of institutional takeaways or learnings have you had over the years mm -hmm. that folks here in the room that are maybe not quite engaged in uh, the level of immersion that you're, that you're providing for your, for your consumer, but what are some of the things that you've learned along the way that anybody could apply, whether they're touring and playing in, in, in clubs or theaters, or mm -hmm. what, what sort of things could, could they take away from what you learned? Um, I think that they always need to be evolving. You know, I think that the people that are doing it right know that the world is becoming more sophisticated. The things that our parents were entertained by or the things that, um, you know, used to be like engaging in a cerebral way to us aren't anymore. You know, we're being hit by advertorial messages and petitions to sign and, and people that need help funding, you know, their projects and home videos. I mean, we're being hit by so much content that there needs to be something better. You need to, you need to think a little harder and be a little more sophisticated about what your, what your offering is. And you don't, even if you don't, you don't completely submerge somebody in experience, um, you, you need to evolve. And um, I think that's, you know, that can apply to, to everybody, you know? I, I feel like um, 4D movie theaters, right, like are doing really well. It's this notion that you can go into a movie theater and watch The Nightmare Before Christmas and it will start Christmas and it will start snowing in the theater. You know, that's cool. That's a movie theater evolving. Um, I think uh, live action cameras are another, you know, great evolution in movie making. It's, it's challenging from an acting standpoint and from a filmmaker standpoint, I think, because um, they have to evolve and, and change the way that they've, they've done it in the past. But all of these things are, are like they're the same industries but different takes on them. You know what I mean? Sort of evolve or die, right? I mean, I think there's kind of a lot isn't of it that quote? Every anything that fails to evolve ceases to exist. Right. Yeah. And if you look in the live entertainment space, there's certainly some very one-dimensional offerings out there that are going away. All in favor of of what you're talking about, which is more sophisticated production, more sophisticated narrative, things that that really immerse the consumer. Yeah. Talk a little bit. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? About what, how you've seen the space evolve in general? Yeah, I um, and I, I always like follow the money, right? Like if you if you look at at any of the revenue trends um, over the past decade, they either go up or they go down. Um, rarely do they just stay flat from an in an industry um, perspective. So I mean, the types of revenue, I mean, zoos, circuses, aquariums, um, revenues have been declining exponentially for a decade because it's just it's not people aren't engaged in that kind of entertainment anymore. It's kind of sad, actually, right? Like, people don't want to go see um, captured animals necessarily. So, I mean, there's like ethical things that people think about now, you know? So, I mean, I feel like those those industries are kind of- Like the zoo, sea world, et cetera, right? Totally antiquated. Yeah. I mean, I think days are numbered. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of live theater um, that, that ne they need to, you know, definitely um, get on the on their on the game because there's this this four wall theater concept is kind of also moving out you know as things like sleep no more and um, and uh, Yumi Bum Bum Train you know create this this moving space theater um, you know model so I think I think ultimately you you know it's it's not a surprise because you can watch the revenue right. the revenue curves of of some of these um, these uh, you know models and. I just tell you, they're either coming or going. <laughs> right. So uh, we, we've talked, I'm, you, you know that I, I, I love Burning Man. Mm -hmm. We talked about Sleep No More. And, and uh, you know, in, in, with, with Burning Man, there's this incredible environment, which is the desert and Black Rock outside Reno. With, with, uh, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. with Sleep No More, it's at the McKittrick Hotel in New York City. How important is that environment to what you're doing, to, uh, to find something that already exists, something cool, some, some ecosystem, an environment, et cetera, for you to come in and then build out from there? Um, it is the most critical. It is, for me, I mean, it's my starting point, me and my team. The first thing we do is figure out what the environment is, and it's usually something nostalgic that, you know, was haunting from your childhood, like camping and stories or being in the woods. Like, we do a lot of things in the woods. Um, because that demeanor, it lends itself to horror, you know? So um, I think that the environment is critical. I mean, and like, we are, you love Burning Man. Like, how critical is that environment for you? 
It's everything. Right? Yeah, yeah. It really is. You start, if you start with a great environment, you're already so ahead of the game. Same thing with, the, with you see the, all the music festivals and, and the, the really the proliferation of the festival space. Uh -huh. The ones that are winning are the ones, the special ones that already have a unique environment like a Coachella or Lollapalooza, et cetera. Um, and I, so I suppose the same for you. It is, yeah, for sure. It's definitely. This. It's funny because my um, my business partner Keith Greco is a huge Burning Man. I call him the mayor of Burning Man. Actually, I think he builds the entire thing. But um, um, he's one of the creators of Cirque du Soleil, and ha right. his mind is just brilliant. You know, so um, environmentally, you know, I, I always call him the Terminator. You know how the Terminator would see in graphs and like and and lines and, and matrix and numbers, um, he sees it in colors. <laughs> so I bring him into an environment and he, you know, then he touches it with his, you know, mastermind and his genius. But, but the, the key is always for those environments to, to have that, that je ne sais quoi, whatever it is before, before we even go in and touch it. And how do you find these people to help you create this world and this environment? Where do they come from? How do you find them? I mean, I, I assume that's the, one of the most important elements is your team that can create this experience. It is, it's the hardest thing that there is for me. I mean, on a daily basis, that is probably the number one biggest challenge to our growth. Um, it is finding people who, number one, have the talents, you know, that, that is good enough for, for me and at 1031 Productions, because obviously, like, no one is good enough. But um, when I find that person, um, you know, having it be somebody who's also passionate you know, about, about this genre and about what we're doing. So, you know, finding that person is tough. We've had the same team for seven years and rarely, you know, does, do we have somebody coming in or out. So um, we're always looking for, for those like soulmate, we call them our soulmate um, candidates. Great, and yeah. talk about some of the content that you create around your experiences and, and how they lend themselves to that. We, um, we, we try to always take a fresh approach with all of the attractions. Um, all of the attractions take place around the country, around the United States, every single year. Um, they're never the same from year to year. And, and now what we've recently been doing, which I'm super stoked about, is um, we're, with the Great Horror Camp Out, we're starting the, the experience weeks before the campers even get there. So we, um, our, our camp headmaster, which is our Mickey Mouse, kind of, for the Great Horror Camp Out, he's our, our host and MC, and he's the icon, the mascot of the event, um, is actually making phone calls to campers who've already bought tickets, who are waiting to come to camp in three weeks, I think we're three weeks out, um, and he's starting the game now. Cool. He's calling them and he's telling them, this is what I need you to do, this is your first clue, go solve it, and you may have your very first piece of SCAG awarded to you before you even step foot on camp out. So we're starting the game now. And for a camper who bought their ticket, and ticket holders are used to buying their ticket and going on the day of event, and that's, you know, that's what they expect. So when your phone rings, and it's the great horror camp out headmaster having a game for you to play, it's, I mean, checkmate. Right. No one's doing that, you know? And how does that scale, though? How do you get, is it, do you, does that engagement in front of your event, is that all social media based, or how does that work? Um, it's both. I mean, it's it's engagement because it's you know it it already puts our campers. It gives them a level of excitement that is you know it's already there before they even get there. So when they get there, they're more excited. They're having more fun. They're already engaged. They already have skin in the game. From a social standpoint, part of the challenge is that they have to post it on their on their Facebooks or on any of their social channels. They have to say exactly what the headmaster is telling them to say, and they have to. It's like a headmaster says type kind of challenge, right. and they have to do it exactly to code. And if they mess up once, you know, or even a little bit, they could. I mean, the repercussions could be very critical. And they become market. They become marketing for your events, obviously. Tons of marketing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right. So talk about generationally. Are you seeing? Is it? you know, 18 and under that, that embrace this and, you know, f folks my age uh, that, that maybe don't, or what, what are you seeing sort of as, as the, that demographic breaks out in the immersive space? Mm. It's, um, it, it really depends on our attraction, but we, as a company, do not really super serve kids. We're an 18 to 34, um, generally, demographic. Um, the hay rides are a little younger, maybe around like the 12, 13, 14, 15 to like 45. So um, 
you know, we, we definitely, it's funny because people always think that, you know, Halloween and horror attractions are for kids. Not at all. I mean, there are so many adults who can't even handle the content of some of our attractions. So, um, you know, we, we definitely are a company that's super serving adults. Got it. Yeah, do you, by the way, you, you, do people ever get hurt? Are there ambulances on site? What is like? Never. <laughs> How does that work? Never. Okay. Yeah, no, we, we actually in seven years, knock on wood, knock on everything, have, um, have a spotless record. We have, I mean, we're, we're crazy about safety. So, um, no, we have, we've, we're very lucky. We have, at the Great Horror Camp, everybody has to sign a death waiver before they're allowed on the premises, though, so, because they can get touched and bagged bound. Talk stage. about that though, the level of interaction. I mean, they are getting. Yeah, the Great Horror Camp Out is our most, um, it's our most intense horror experience. So it's the high octane um, experience and you, we have a buried alive um, challenge where you will actually be buried alive tight claustrophobic spaces, you'll have to, um, we've had swimming holes where you have to go into a swimming hole, basically strip down, um, you can get, you know, there's things in the swimming hole that will pull you out of your inner tube, you get leech stuff, leeches stuck on you, the leech though, you, you're inclined to take it off and like throw it, it's skagged, you gotta, you gotta keep it. They feel very real, but they're not. Um, there's, you know, bloody tug of wars, people get caged and put in um, and locked in trunks and you have to barter your way out or figure out how to solve something to get, to get out of, of captivity. Um, you can have a burlap sack shoved over your head when you're least expecting it and hiked away out of camp and you can get disqualified for lots of different things. So we give them 24 hours of notice with a, do a dossier that's sent to them to study, learn the rules of camp so that they're more prepared to to actually survive the whole 12 hours, but um, if you're if you're there to play, you're in, involved in a pretty high octane game, and not everybody survives the 12 hours. <laughs> so the bu the buzzwords, of course, uh, especially online, it's all about engagement, right? It's, yeah. It's, it's less about total followers and really more about a combination of followers and engagement. Mm -hmm. And sounds like with what you're doing, you get the ultimate in terms of engagement. Can you talk about that? We do. I mean, we get we get a ton of engagement. Um, because you know the the passion level for this genre is high you know it's um i mean it's like the comic con kids and the people who love gaming like horror it has already this um this organic engagement instilled in it because people just love it um people love to be scared because they're you know the adrenaline rush of being scared actually there's an, it's an actual real physical reaction it releases dopamine in your body so so it's it's something that people crave and want to do so um the level of engagement is is incredibly high, and and that's part of the experience. If you don't engage, um, you you won't have you, you won't even experience what there is is to do. So, what what's the uh, opportunity for brands with with this kind of uh, with with haunted hayride and beyond? Is there is there integration possibilities, or how does that work in your world? Um, I think I think there's tons of integration um, possibilities with haunted hayride with 1031 Productions. I I mean I think going back to what we were talking about, um, you know, with with immersive and and where has it been? Where is it going? You know, I think um, I think the world is built up of collaborations, right? Like it's it's all about um, big giant collaborations and um, and what we can learn from those collaborations will kind of dictate where we go in this space and every space. But you know, industries and pioneers have always been created through through revolutionary. Uh, collaborations like electricity, like we were given electricity, an electrical grid from Thomas, a collaboration from Thomas Edison and the Vanderbilt and J.P. Morgan. Um, Bill Gates and, and uh, Paul Allen gave us Microsoft, which changed the game for us. The, the space station is a collaboration of nations, right? So, I mean, these are all things that, that changed humanity. So I think in, in anything, if we can learn from those things, you know, collaborations will either turn immersive entertainment into, um, into you know, us sitting in chairs with plugs in the back of our heads like the Matrix, or it will open up an incredible platform um, for the creative process that will just be mind blowing in the future. Just the purple pill, right? <laughs> you take the purple pill or the red pill? <laughs>